Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. How's everybody doing? Where did you actually here last week? I said last week, if you were here, if you know how many people were here, right? And I was like, we gotta be, like do that again this week. You guys think we did a good job? Those of you who were last year here last week? It's a pretty good job, right? It's a pretty full room. Glory to God, this is beautiful, this is amazing, right? Um, so welcome. If this is your first this is your first time here. Welcome. First and foremost, that's the most important thing. Welcome to this space. Welcome to OTYG. Uh, last week, we had our little kickoff kind of explaining what everything is that we do here, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but you'll find out soon enough, right? So those of you who are kind of wondering what's going to go on today is we're starting a new series. So you came at a perfect time when this is your first time. We're starting a new series, and this is probably my favorite series to teach, my favorite series to learn about. My Sunday school, school students who are here, you're going to hear it again. Yes, you already heard it, but you're going to hear it again so you can teach it next time. So, no complaints. Uh, this series essentially covers a lot of things, right? Probably the biggest question everybody has is, does God exist? That's probably the biggest question probably in the history of mankind. Like, does God exist? If he does exist, which God is it? Is it the Christian God? Is it the Muslim God? Is it the God of Buddhism, Like, which is multiple gods? Like, what is it? What is the truth? Is there an objective truth or is it an opinion? Is it an opinion? Like, is it just everybody's taste? Like, is it, oh, you like Islam, you like Christianity, whatever, it's up to you, do your thing. What is the truth? Is there even a God? Right? Is there even a God? So these are the kind of things we're gonna analyze. So today, we're gonna spend most of the time just kind of looking at points to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the name of this series. You guys know who came up with that name? That was <laughs> Beyond reasonable doubt. That's the name of the series. Okay? So the thing with God, the thing with the existence of God, right? To fully like prove something, like none of us have seen God face to face, right? So we can't say a hundred percent sure, a hundred percent certainty that God indeed exists. But we can't be on reasonable doubt. We can prove it. For example, George Washington. Raise your hand if you've seen who George Washington is. If you've seen him, if you met him. Only one person in this room I know has done this stuff. Uh, but, but nobody here has seen him. Nobody here has heard of him. Nobody here has seen a live picture of him. We've seen paintings. How are we able to verify beyond a reasonable doubt that he existed? There's been documents. There's been preserved evidence that's been checked, that's been like uh, reviewed. And beyond a reasonable doubt, we can conclude that George Washington was indeed the first president. The Jesus, the Jesus Christ exists? Is that a fact or is that a, just an opinion? It's a fact. It's a historical fact. Even atheists will claim that Jesus Christ existed. In fact, famous uh, atheist Bart Ehrman, he says that the only thing we can be sure about this person of Christ is that he existed and he was crucified. That's it. That's all we can be sure about. Obviously, we don't agree with that. But my point is, it's a fact that he was on this earth in like ancient Palestine teaching, persecuted, crucified. That's a fact. And he made certain claims. He made certain claims. He says, I am the Messiah. I am the God. I am the Son of God. I will die and I will resurrect. I will save people from these, their sins. These are all claims he made. Now, what we're going to do throughout the next several weeks, we're going to analyze these claims. Do these claims make sense? Can we verify them beyond a reasonable doubt? And we're going to compare them to religions such as Islam and Judaism. What do they have to say about the person of Christ? What is their claim, right? Because everybody has a, everybody believes that their faith is right, right? Everybody believes that their faith is right. Just as pa like passionate we are about orthodoxy, about Christianity, you have a Muslim, the same way. You have a, a Jew, the same way. But here's the thing, we can't all be correct. Because if, if we're talking about the person of Christ, either he was crucified or he wasn't. These are definitive claims. Either he was or he wasn't. Somebody has to be right. Either he claimed he was God or he didn't. Either he died and resurrected or he didn't. One or the two has to be true. They both can't coexist. There has to be an objective answer. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? Perfect. So today what we're gonna tackle a big we're gonna tackle a big question is does God exist and how do we know that? And as I do this, I'm gonna try to keep it digestible. But just know this is probably the deepest, most hardest topic to understand. I'm gonna try not to throw big words at you. If you look at me confused, I'll try to like fix it, okay? But we're gonna start with that. And there's this meme right there. I thought it was funny. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, clearly nobody else thought it was funny, it's okay. <laughs> I thought it was funny. 
So why did we decide to do this series? Why did we decide to do the series? The reason why we decided to do this series specifically is that there is an attack on theism, meaning there's an attack on those who believe in God, excuse me, especially the Christian God, especially Christianity, right? Nowadays, if you claim you're Christian, especially like in Seattle and stuff, if you claim you're a Christian, people look at you like you're crazy. Like you're one of those, like come on, like relax. In 2022, like really like, we're progressive out here, chill out, like, you know? Like, that's that's the kind of mentality a lot of people have. If you say you're Christian, if you post about Christianity, if you practice it, all these kind of things, people are just like, eh, like, come on, like, there's a, they have a bad taste in their mouth about Christianity, and we'll get into that, whether that's justified or not. In some cases, it is justified. We'll get into that. People ask questions, right? Like, you know, you really believe that Moses part of the Red Sea? Like, sometimes y'all gotta think about it. Like, what if I told you, like, my, my friend, like, you know, I saw him, he was right there on like, you know, al Beach, and he's like, whoosh, and like the water is like spread apart. Like you would think I'm crazy. You would think I'm crazy. What if I told you I know a guy, my cousin actually, back in Ethiopia. He was swallowed by a whale, and he was in there for three days. And the whale spit him out, I promise. Y'all would think I'm crazy, right? These are some of the stories in the Bible though. Moses part of the Red Sea. Jonah was swallowed by the whale. For three days he lived in the well. Isn't there like acid in the well stomach? Like kind of how is that even possible? Is that real? Like when it comes out your mouth, like you start to be like, dang, like, you know? And that's how people feel when they hear these things. They're like, these are this is what Christians believe. This is what Christians believe. Come on, they like it's like believing like the tooth fairy. It's like believing in Santa. There's no evidence for it. So these are all miracles, right? A virgin birth, Saint Mary giving birth to Christ, being a virgin doesn't make sense. These are all miracles. They defy logic. They defy nature. But if a God indeed exists, are these far-fetched? If there's a God that exists indeed, are any of these miracles far-fetched? They're not. So that's what we're going to look at. So believing in God has become associated with immaturity and ignorance. Immaturity and ignorance from a lot of people. And people are leaving the faith like in big numbers. Like, I'm sure you guys have noticed, especially in America, that's a fact that's declining, but not only in America, in the world, everywhere you go. Christianity is declining. There's an attack on Christianity, there's an attack on religion, there's an attack on these kind of beliefs. And it's declining, and people don't have a response back. That's one of the reasons why it's declining. Because there's all these tough questions that we don't have answers to. All these tough questions that we feel like there's no evidence. All these tough questions that we think we can only take by faith. But I'm here to tell you, faith is important, but we have evidence for the faith that we have. Welcome, I think we have two chairs here. People are leaving faith, not just American Christians, but Ethiopian and Eritrean Christians as well. Raise your hand if you know anybody who's left the faith. Anybody who's converted to different religions. Raise your hand up high. Anybody who converted to a different religion. Right? We have a few people, we have a few people. Now. One of the reasons why I started service, for example, is because I saw somebody close to me leave the faith. Somebody close to me become a different faith. And that bothered me because it's like, dang, I received all this from my faith and you weren't, I, you weren't able to connect to it the same way I did. I wish I could have helped you. And that really ate at me. Now my question to you guys is, is when you hear about friends, when you hear about people you know, people you care about, leaving the faith, does that bother you? Or is it more of, hey man, like, if Islam's your thing, girl, do your thing. Like, what, like, does it bother you? Or is it just like, everybody do your thing? Whatever makes you happy, makes you happy. This, which one is it? Does it bother us? Or is it, as long as she's happy, as long as he's happy, do your thing? Let's be honest, it's usually the other one. As long as you're happy, as long as you found what works for you, do it. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? If you get a call, right, if you get a call, and you're, somebody's calling you, they're like, yo, like, I'll use uh, Addis' example, because I always think of, he's not here anyways, but let's say Addis, uh, I call Addis, right? And I say, yo, like, your cousin, like, is he at this location? He's like, yeah, he's at that location. I'm like, bro, you gotta get him. In 30 minutes, like, something bad's gonna happen there. You gotta go get him, or like, his life is on the line. His life is on the line, you gotta go save him. What is Addis gonna do? He's gonna save him, right? Why? Because his, his, the, like, his cousin's life depends on it. If God exists, let's say Christianity is true. We haven't proved it yet. Let's say, actually, you know, let's, let's say Islam is true. And 
Actually, no, let's, which one should I pick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say Christianity is true. I think that works better. If Christianity is true, those who do not believe in Christianity will suffer the consequences Christianity states, correct? If Islam is true, those who do not believe in Islam will suffer the consequences that Islam states, correct? Yeah. And to speak a little bit on Islam, it's very blunt about what happens to Christians. Like, there's no questions about it. It will, it literally says, if you are a Christian, you're done for, buddy. Like, that's what it says. Like, essentially, we'll get into it. And so, if we know that these consequences exist, if a God exists, why doesn't it bother us when our friends are leaving the faith? We haven't, we haven't proven Christianity exists, but we believe it. So why doesn't it bother us when our friends leave the faith? Why do we say, do your thing, whatever makes you happy? Just like Adis would run to save his friend in that house if he found out something bad was going to happen, why don't we run to save our friends? Why don't we run to save our family, whatever, if we know they're walking down the wrong path? The answer is twofold. Either we're not convinced ourselves God exists, or we just haven't gotten to know God well enough yet. <clears throat> Forget leaving the religion. Don't be shy. <clears throat> forget leaving the religion. Right? We were like, let's forget that. What about people in the religion? What about people who identify as Christian? People who say they believe in Jesus Christ to be God. They say it, but nothing about their lives indicates it. There's a term for them. It's practical atheism. Like you may not be an atheist, you may you may claim you believe God, but you live your life as such of a, as such like God doesn't exist. Whatever God's opinion is on certain things, it doesn't bother you. You live your life how you want to live it. But you still claim Christianity. What's the difference between that and atheism? Now I'm not saying be perfect. None of us are perfect. We make mistakes. Christianity is about getting back up. It's not about perfection. It's about getting back up. But if you're not even concerned about getting back up, if you're just like, I'm living my life, I don't care if I fall, I don't care if I get back up, but I do believe in God, that doesn't work. That's practical atheism. It's just we're kind of, we're not, we're not confident enough to come out and say it, but that's how we're living our life. How do you think Christ looks at us? What does Christ say? If you have fellowship with darkness, you have no fellowship with me. It's blunt. If you choose to dwell in darkness, you don't dwell with me. I don't know who you are. Christian means follower of Christ. Are you guys good back there? All right, I hope you all are good. Christianity means follower of Christ. If you are not living your life as such, Christ does not recognize you as such. It's practical atheism. It's like I'm married, right? Let's say I'm married. I'm not married. Not yet. Hopefully this one. I'm not married Let's say I'm married, right? But I cheat on my wife regularly. I would never. <laughs> I cheat on my, life, my wife regularly. Like, I cheat on her for years. In practicality, like, yeah, technically, legally, we're married. But in practicality, I'm living my life as if I'm single. I'm living my life as if I'm single. Yes, in technical terms, if you look at the document, I am married to this person. But I'm living as if I am single. In my wife's eyes, she thinks I'm moving like I'm single. Technically, we may be Christians, but we are not living a committed relationship to Christ. So like I said earlier, religion is not just a matter of faith, right? And also, in, order, in addition to that, everybody can't be right. There's this idea, it's called religious, religious pluralism, which is we're all right. This whole thing is kumbaya, you do your thing, you do your thing, we're all right. And that's good, that's okay. For like a country to live together in harmony with people because the fact is we can't convert everybody so to say like you know your religion is good my religion is good let's live like that's okay for a country like to live in unity to keep peace but that's not true we all cannot be right as for the reasons i said earlier right religion like for here for example in america religion is a preference it's like you know pizza like pineapple on pizza it's a preference like you like islam do islam you like buddhism do you like, like you like this whatever that's what it is here it's a preference that's not, what, that's not how God intended it to be, right? So I'm going to use two big terms. But before I do that, uh, religions all have truth claims. This is why they can't all be true. Because religions have definitive claims. Like I said in the beginning, Islam has definitive claims. Buddhism has definitive claims. Christianity has definitive claims. 
Me, you guys know what definitive claims are? Do you guys know what I mean by that? It means it either happened or it didn't. They're making it like a statement, right? They're making a statement. So we're gonna analyze some of these statements. For example, I'm gonna use this word theist. You guys know what the word theist means? It's those who believe in like a monotheistic God, essentially, just a little complicated with that. It's those who believe in God, like one God. So that's your Muslims, that's your Jews, that's your Christians, okay? And then you have uh, like atheists and then also like polytheists, like people who believe in multiple gods. So it's like Hinduism, all these kind of things, Buddhism, these kind of things, the universe is like God, all these things, you know? So it's like basically not one God, it's multiple gods. In a nutshell, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Both of those can't be true. Either there is one God or there's multiple gods. Does that make sense? One God or multiple gods. So that's what we're doing this year. We're gonna analyze it, because everything cannot be true. Does that make sense? Okay, good. <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about faith, though, because we're not gonna really talk about faith throughout this series. We're gonna talk about evidence. We're gonna talk about facts. We're gonna talk about these kinds of things. We're here to prove things. Right now, let's act like we don't know anything. Let's act like we're trying to figure out the truth for ourselves right now. We're trying to figure out what Christianity is. Let's leave, actually, for the, for the next hour or two, that we are in here for the next several weeks, let's come in here acting like we know nothing. Let's be objective. Let's investigate. Let's do that. But before we do that, I want to talk about faith just real quick. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So we all want answers, right? But an element of faith is needed. An element of faith is needed to believe in God. The purpose of this is to prove it beyond reasonable doubt. I just have to set that ground framework, okay? We all have, need to have some sort of faith, right? We all need to have some sort of faith. And not only that, we all need to have genuine faith. Genuine faith. You cannot go into heaven based off evidence alone. I've seen Christian debaters who are geniuses, who literally debate atheists and like embarrass atheists. But their manner, their conduct in which they do it is not Christian-like. They are cursing at them. Not saying bad words, but like making fun of them. They're being completely disrespectful. If you look on the YouTube channels, it's like, look at this, like, you know, forgive me, this literally what it says, like, uh, this idiot, like, Muslim person said this, and this response. Is that Christian life? Is that Christian life? You could have all the evidence that you want. If you are not acting like a Christian, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Faith and genuine, like, love for your neighbor needs to be there. In the Bible, there's a story about the uh, woman. She was bleeding for 12 years. Right, you guys know that story? This woman, she's bleeding for 12 years. And if you guys know anything about ancient Palestine, first of all, women are not looked at in high regard, okay? So just being a woman off that is just already looked down upon. And she's bleeding. So if you're bleeding by Jewish law, Jewish law you're unclean. So she's sick, clearly. She's not just bleeding to bleed, she is sick. And she's like literally like just crawling around, just like begging, like nobody pays attention to her. Everybody's walking past her. Nobody has any, want anything to do with her. And she sees Christ coming, and she, of course she's heard the rumors about Christ. And you know what she says? If only I could touch just the corner of his robe. Like, if I could just get there, if I could crawl and bring myself there, just to touch a piece of his robe, I believe I'll be healed. So she makes her way, she crawls, she crawls, she crawls, she touches the robe, and Christ turns around. And surely she's afraid, like, you know, she's, she's touching a male's robe. Like, what if he yells at me? And he says, woman of good faith. Like be of good cheer. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. The fact that you had that faith, that you touched me, it would heal you. Let it be done for you. You're healed. Compare that to us. Compare that to us. When we're like, when we're kids or whatever you're doing right now, like when our parents come into our room, it's Evan and they're doing this in the room, we're like, Mom, but relax. Like, come on. Like, it is 6 a.m. right now. You don't need to, you can just come wait. Like, you know, that's what we say. We don't really, Mom, you're sick. Mom's like, here's Evan. Like, come on, Mom, give me the title. Like, what's up? Like, you know, that's what we say. When our moms like kiss the kiss the church before they enter, when our parents kiss the church before they enter, they're not doing it as customs. That is faith that this building is holy. That is what we have lost while we are growing up in the West. Everything we want evidence for, everything we want proof for, everything we see it in the way we grew up. Right? Our parents are like telling us something. We're like, why? And they're like, just cause. We're like, why? They're like, I thought it. Like, stop. Like, you know, they get mad about it. Right? And it's okay to ask why. It's okay to have to want answers to certain things. But at some point, you also need to combine that with faith. Just trusting. Because if you're constantly just looking up for answers, if you're like, God, why did this happen? I need you to explain it for me. You think God's going to explain it? That's arrogance. To demand that kind of explanation for everything. Sometimes you won't understand why things happen. You just have to be okay with it. Because faith heals you. Faith heals you. 
sometimes we have to let go of what we're holding on to in our past and let Christ heal us and put faith in God. So there's a story, right? Could be true, could be fake, I don't know. There's a, there was a man, he was hiking, right? He's doing this thing, he's one of those adventurous types. Like, the weird people, right? He's doing this thing and he stumbles. He stumbles and he falls. And he's like hanging off the cliff, right? The cliff is like crumbling, it's about to fall. He's about to fall. And so he prays to God, he's like, God, if you're there, please, please help me. Like, I will change my life around. Please help me, you know? And so God appears. He's like, I've answered your prayer. I'm here to help you. And he's like, yeah, let's go. Like, I knew you were real, God. I promise. Like, you know, please help me. And God's like, of course, my son, I'll help you. You know what I need you to do, though? I need you to let go of the cliff. I need you to let go of the cliff. The guy's like, can you, like, save me as I'm holding on to the like, like, lift me up like this, like, you know? And he's like, no, 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 I need you to let go. He's like, I can't do it. We hold on to unstable things all the time and God's asking us to let go. And we're saying no. We're holding on to these relationships that are not good for us and God's saying let go. We're holding on to these habits of lying, of cheating, of just being like all these kind of things that's against God. We're holding on to it and we're asking God to bless our life. And he's like, okay, I got you. I'll bless your life. Just let go of what you're doing right now though. Turn back to me. Turn back your evil ways. We're holding on to these things that are unstable. When we have, like, when we're stressed, when we have this drama in our lives, a lot of us who turn to weed, we turn to alcohol. Like, that's the truth. Let's be honest. We've all done these things. These are all unstable things. Yes, it may provide us temporary safety, temporary feelings of comfort, but that does not last forever. Christ is saying, let go of these things so I can give you long-lasting peace, long-lasting safety. So let's let go of these unstable things in our life and put our faith in God's healing. <clears throat> the purpose, another reason why we're doing this series, right, is because a lot of people, once you get into college, it usually starts in college and then it carries over into college. You start to have questions for yourself, right? You start to hear other people ask you these questions as well. Like, does God even exist? How do you know Christianity is true? How do you know the Bible is credible? And when you get start, when you get start, when people start asking these difficult questions, guess what happens? These questions become your questions. I think you're right. Like, I opened up my Bible and, like, the craziest story ever. Like, how do I know this is real? My, my day today has actually been pretty bad. Like, does God really exist? Or the other way, people introduce you to a different religion because you can't answer your own questions about your religion. So now you leave your religion. It happens all the time. But, and this is the thing, though. The Bible encourages you to have reasons for your faith. The Bible doesn't encourage you just to be just like pushovers and just be, don't open your mouth about your faith and just be humble. No, 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 no. The Bible says if someone says something wrong about your faith, speak up. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of me, speak up. What does this say in Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? It says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give a reason. As Christians, we are all here as Christians. We have no excuse. We have to be able to provide reasons for the faith that we have. Christ calls us the light of the world. If we can't provide reason for the faith that we have, how can we be a light for the world? How can we bring others to him? How can we introduce what he's done for our life to others? How can we do it? How can we do it? I use this example a lot. We put effort in the relationships that matter to us all the time. Our relationship with our parents, our friends, our significant other. But if we put zero relationship to our, our Christ, our God. Zero relationship to getting to know him. Zero relationship to getting to know what he likes, what he doesn't like. Zero, zero effort. Sorry. Why? We do it in every other aspect of our life. Why not this? Why do we think this is acceptable in this, but not everything else? Would any friend tolerate you giving minimum effort to them? Would any significant other to tolerate giving minimum effort to them? But we have a patient Christ, a patient God, who constantly is being patient with us. So again, the purpose of this is to find reasons for our faith. So let's all like lock in, let's all pay attention, let's all really get the most out. Because you get what you put in, you can come in here and just like, just be here and not be present and you'll just get nothing out of it. It's kind of a waste of your time. But as we're here today, as we're here the next coming weeks and I hope people continue to come, let's really internalize these things. Let's really meditate on these things. Let's go home and look at it. Also fact check me by the way. Don't just be like, oh, I know this was true. Fact check me. In fact, after this I'm done, I'm, like, I'm gonna say a lot of things. Let's talk about it outside. If you think I'm not telling the truth, if you think you disagree, whatever, let's talk about it. Let's have a discussion about it. <clears throat> So that's what, for, that's what Peter said. 
where what's the context behind this? I love like the Bible because you need you get you enjoy the most of it when you look at the context. A lot of people they pull out random verses and like aha, this is what it means. That's not how the Bible works. The Bible is not one book, by the way. It's multiple books with different authors who have different purposes, different agendas for writing it. You cannot read a book of the Bible without knowing the purpose and the audience and the agenda behind that book. So the audience, the purpose of the book of Peter, which this verse is from, is he's talking to Jewish people who are Christians who just converted and have been exiled for their Christianity. They've been exiled for being Christians. So it's basically similar to Christians that like grew up Christians, but once they get to college, they feel the exile. Once they get into the workforce, they feel the exile. They feel like it's hard to pray in public. They tuck their cross in between their shirts. It's a type of exile. It's a type of being exiled. Right? It's, bit, it's really similar to that. So they're being severely persecuted by their neighbors. And when we're talking about persecution, I'm talking about death. I'm not talking about bad words. I'm not talking about subtweeting. I'm talking about death. Like, you know, that's the kind of persecution they're, they're feeling. And so Peter is reminding them that they're a family of Christians. And this is the theme of the Bible, by the way. Suffering. If you listen to Western Christianity, it's all about like love and just holding hands. Life is good. Like you want a Tesla, just like manifest it, whatever. Like no, it actually is not like that. Yes, God will reward you, but it's never in the world the way we think it is. Christ is concerned about concerned about eternity. That's what we need to understand. He wants us to be okay in this world. He does not want us to be broken in this world. Absolutely not. But his main priority is eternity. What can I do to get my child with me for eternity? And sometimes that means taking away things out of our life that may hurt us, that we don't understand, that we wonder why the heck did this happen to me? And this is terrible. I can't even fathom how God would do this. He's thinking about eternity. That's his main concern. That's his main concern. Um, there's, a, there's this book I was reading, and it's a true story. It's about a saint. <clears throat> so this, this saint, right, he's talking, he's walking through his childhood, he, he died as a kid. And um, he was just different from the day he was born. Like, he was just really quiet. And, like, when he was, like, four or five years old, he would always stay in his room. And he would always be by, like, the, the holy paintings, like, the, like, the movie touching, like, uh, the angels and everything. And he would call them his friends. Like, he didn't want to play with friends. Like, he said, these are my people, these are my friends. And his parents were like, oh, this is cute. Like, okay, like, a little different, but, like, this is cute. Like, I love it. It's good for him. You know, tell that. Like, you know, these kind of things. And then he goes into school, obviously, and he's developed this kind of mentality. He just wants to be with God. Every time he goes to school, he's thinking about going back home into his room, locking the door, just being with God. So he goes to school, and he's just sitting down in the cafeteria, doing his thing, sitting by himself, just like counting the seconds till he gets home. And people see this, and they're like, this kid's weird. Like, why is he, like, by himself doing these things? Why is he praying? Like, why is he looking at the ceiling? Stuff? What's up with that? And so some kids, they go up to him, and they take his food. And he's like, wait, wait, wait. Like, take my fries, too. Take my drink. You forgot my drink. You can take it. And they're like, what the heck? Like, that made him even more angry. That made him even more angry. And so they would rob him, right? They would rob him for what he had on him. And if they ever forgot something, he would chase him down. Be like, you forgot this, too. Like, please take it. And then this kind of like humility, this kind of stuff kept happening. And then eventually they're like, like we really don't like this kid. No one was looking, like they beat him up. And after they beat him up, he said, I'm sorry for whatever I did to you to make you do this thing. And like these beatings kept happening to the point where like, hey, his body couldn't take it anymore. So like he goes to the physician or whatever and it's not looking good and his mother is, as you would imagine, just broken. And she's like, I wish I could have protected you. Like, where was God? Like, all this time you spent with God, where was he? Where was he? And he says, Mom, don't you hear them? The angels are singing for him. They're ready to receive him. This is what Christianity is about. This earth is like, what does Christ say? If they hated me, if they persecuted me, what do you think they'll do to you? My followers. What happened to the apostles? What did they receive on this earth? Nothing. But we read about them and we know what they received in the afterlife. We know that they received the crown of righteousness. We know that they received eternal peace. We know that they received eternal love. And that's what Christ is concerned about. Eternity. If we're not being persecuted as Christians, we've got to really ask ourselves. If Christianity has become easy. We've got to really ask ourselves, how hard am I really going? 
how serious is my physical routine? Because the harder you go, the more effort you put in, you see how much like harder life gets. You start to lose friends. You start to lose like different like gatherings, things, stuff like that. But in those moments, you gotta keep in mind that there's literally like your room is being prepared for you in heaven. Your room is being prepared for you. And you know what's crazy? It's sad. Forget other people persecuting us. I feel like Christians persecute each other the most. I feel like us in this room, we persecute each other the most. Because this is a space where we all feel safe. But we've had moments, right, where we're like trying to be a good Christian, and our friends are like, you're doing too much right now. We're not at fellowship. We're not at church. Relax. It's a Saturday night. Chill out. That's persecution. And it's coming from the people you feel the most safe with. That's what it is. Right? People telling you, you've gotten too religious. You switched up. You changed up. And these are the things you will hear. I've heard this countless of times. Like, my only friends are my roommates. <laughs> like, you know? Like, I've heard this. Like, my friends in high school and college, like, I don't really, like, see them anymore. It's like, you switched up. You changed. You're into all these kind of things. These are persecutions. And it's guaranteed to happen. Welcome. time to mention that uh, the side doors for those of you who have been coming late is open like um, the door the front door closes at six so coming through the back or through the side we start at seven o'clock okay so uh, where was I I lost my train of thought where was I where was I good good okay now I'm gonna fast forward now I'm gonna fast forward we're gonna talk about God's existence we're gonna talk about God's existence you guys with me Everybody with me? This is like the most people I've ever seen. I apologize to the two people on our left. to what we all came here for, the existence of God. And I'm going to try to wrap up as fast as I can because we do discussions after. But like I said, this is going to be the longest, by the way. Let me give you that disclaimer. This is going to be the longest part of the series and it's going to be the most confusing. Hopefully it's not too confusing, but I promise you it gets more straightforward after that. So, the answer to God's existence will determine if life has meaning or not. Everybody who's ever existed has contemplated the meaning of life. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose here? Where am I going? We've all had these things. In one way or another, we've had those real moments where like, we felt these things. True story. True story, Ada. Can we turn the live off? That's fine. That's fine. So, I, I might get in trouble for this. Don't tell anybody. Uh, I'm not proud of this. So back in the day, long time ago in undergrad, years ago. I'm way past that. Christ, before I knew Christ. Uh, <laughs> so what we would do is uh, we would be like at somebody's house, right? And it'd be like a Friday night or whatever. And people would be like, oh, there is this gathering happening here. And not this type of gathering, but a different type of gathering. And we're like, okay, like sounds good. Like it's Friday night, like let's go. And so we go to this gathering and before the gathering, there's like a pre-gathering. You know? <laughs> so, there's a pre-gathering, right? So we're, out, we're at the pre-gathering and they're serving us drinks, juice. Like, so the thing with this, like, juice is like, and, and it's like something was weird with the juice. I'm not joking, like something is up with the juice, it didn't taste good, and it made me feel weird. So we did that, whatever, and we had a lot of it. And so at this time, we go to the actual gathering. Remember, we're at the pre-gathering. We're at the gathering. So we go to the gathering, and I step in the gathering, everybody's like, like having fun, and just like, you know, just like shaking hands with each other and stuff, just like waving, you know? Like nothing crazy. And I'm in there losing my mind. I'm like, I need to go home immediately. Like, I do not feel well. So I go to the bathroom, and I try to gather myself. I like splash water on my face. And I look in the mirror, and I'm like looking at myself, and I'm just like touching myself. I'm like, I'm really here. <laughs> like, 
I'm alive right now. Like, I'm breathing. I'm Abel. <laughs> like, it's hitting me. It's like, I'm literally alive. Like, have you guys ever thought about that? Like, <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Like, like have those one-on-one -on -one moments with yourself, and you're like, I'm really living right now. Like, who am I? Like, I literally had that, and I'm just in the bathroom. At this time, hours had passed by. Cause my friends were looking for me, I pulled the phone up. I didn't even know I'm just staring at the mirror. And so they come and give me like, bro, like, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing, bro. Like, I'm good. I'm good. And they're like, like everybody's leaving. We gotta go. We gotta leave the gathering. We gotta go back to Bible study. So we uh, we leave or whatever, and we're in the car, and I'm staring out the window. The whole time, just like, just like looking out the window, and I'm super quiet. Everybody's talking. I'm just looking out the window, and they're just like, "This guy's weird. Like, we're not hanging out with this guy again. Like, he's not coming out with us ever again." And so they park the car, and they're like, "Okay, let's leave." And I'm like, "Y'all go ahead. I think I'm gonna stay." Like, bro, get get out the car. I'm like, "You're, you're right. Like, let me get out the car." Which the point is, we've all had these questions about our existence. Why are we here? What is our purpose? What am I? If God does not exist, life has no meaning. Life has no purpose. It doesn't matter if you do right or wrong. It doesn't matter if you do good or bad. Why? Because at the end of the day, we have the same destiny. We both die and we turn to dust and nothing happens after. You're a great person. Congratulations, I'm a terrible person. We're both gonna end up the same place. Let's say I'm driving to Tacoma. I may take the highway, I just may take the back road. There's no back road, but you know what I'm saying. It's too far. <laughs> Either way, we're gonna to get to the same location. It doesn't matter how we get there, we're getting to the same place. If God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter how you live your life because there is no purpose. There is no afterlife, there's nothing there. But if God does exist, then that means your life has meaning. Because God promises afterlife. Now we have something to work for. Now we have something to like, we have a, like a, a desire to do good versus bad. We have all these things. If there's a purpose for you, then there is a right or wrong the way you live your life because your choices will affect your eternity. Does that make sense? But if there is no God, what's the point? Do you, are you guys with me? Is that too complicated? No. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about the beginning of the universe, right? This is part of the first, first part of three evidences, pieces of evidence for the beginning of the universe. Fancy word is the cosmological argument. That's the fancy word to say the start of the universe. How did the universe start? What do y'all think? Like, how did this? How did everything start? Like, what, how are we here? Don't say God. Like, give me like. <laughs> Big Bang Theory, all these kind of things. So this argument basically say, says the argument of the. Uh, this is dark. This argument is stating that the beginning of the universe was started by God. That's what this is saying. So the thing with science is, by the way, a lot of people have a misconception that science and religion don't go together. Like either you're faith, you have Christian faith or you're religious or you're a scientist, you can't be both. That's not true at all. I forgot which, uh, which, uh, which like scientist said this, like really smart dude. He said like, uh, science without God is foolishness. Science without God is foolishness. Because there's certain things you can't fill in, you can't find out. In fact, Einstein, sound like a nerd. Einstein, in his theory of relativity, <laughs> no, basically he came up with this theory about kind of, uh, it has to do with gravity, but basically the indication of the theory is that the universe had a beginning. And if the universe had a beginning, that means somebody had to create it, correct? And that bothered him. That bothered him to his core. Because that means that, like, there has to be something supreme. There has to be something above it. And he couldn't figure out what it was. He couldn't figure out what caused the Big Bang. He couldn't figure out, and it drove him insane. So you know what he said, he used to be atheist. He said, you know what? There's no way of knowing there's a God or not. I'm agnostic, I'm agnostic. But like he lived his life trying to make sure that there was, like he wanted to argue the universe was eternal. Because guess what, if the universe existed forever, that means there was no God needed, correct? But his equation proved that there was a beginning. Which indicates huh? that there was a creator, correct? So here's the thing. Let's, let's analyze this. Either the universe has been around forever or it had a beginning. It can't be both. Are we on the same page? Either it had a beginning or it's been around, around, around forever. And that used to be the argument a lot of atheists had. The universe has been around forever. What is the problem with that argument? 
What is the problem with the universe being around forever? Why does that not make sense? Can't Who can answer that? Can't sure, you can, you can investigate, yeah. Timeline? timeline? Yeah. Speak more about that. Um, like, if we say that time exists, Okay, good. More. Anybody else? What is the problem with saying the universe has been around forever? So the Big Bang Theory? Hmm? So, the, the Big Bang theory. so the Big Bang Theory actually uh, came about when they found out the universe had a beginning. Right. So prior to that, they said they argued that it was around forever. And I'm asking, like, what is the problem with that argument? Yeah. Humans. Humans existing within a certain time. Sure. Those are all. Those are all like. Those are all. Those all work. So, if the universe is around forever, we can say that it's infinitely long, right? Infinitely long. Correct. How long is infinite? Infinite. Infinite. Like you can't even fathom it. Like you know, it's crazy. That's what we call God. Like in an infinite God, you can't fathom how long it is. This is. It's almost like so obvious. It's like how do they not recognize this? If the universe was infinity, let's take today as a point in time, right? Let's imagine a timeline. If the universe is infinitely long then that means there was an infinite amount of events prior to today, correct? Like things just kept happening, because it was infinitely long, right? And there is no like, the infinite means there's no end to it. Today's ending, correct? There still is tomorrow, has tomorrow happened yet? Has October 8th happened yet? I hope that's the date. Has it happened yet? It has not, it has not happened yet. That, that automatically is a self-defeating statement, because infinite means it's just like it never ends, it keeps going, right? But also in addition to that, you know what they found out when they were using Einstein's equation? They found out the universe is expanding. Have you guys heard that in science class? That the universe is constantly expanding? What does that mean? If it's expanding, it had to start from somewhere, right? It had to have started from point zero. Correct? Correct? Are you guys with me? These are all scientifically proven things, right? And a lot of people think the Big Bang is a bad word. Like, oh my gosh, I don't, like, you don't say that in church, like you don't Big Bang. You know, I'm here to tell you, I'm gonna do The Big Bang has really good evidence. And in fact, most Christians, they don't have a problem with the Big Bang. They have a problem with the theory that it happened spontaneously. If there is a Big Bang, there had to have been somebody who started it. Science, the foundation of science is the law of causality, meaning everything has a cause. Like you guys are here because you drove. You didn't just poop here. You didn't just appear here, right? Something had to have caused you to come here. That table, these chairs, somebody had to make it. Everything that ever existed had to have a cost. That is the main foundation of science. But atheists want to say the Big Bang just happened. We, may, we cannot prove that these things are wrong. We cannot prove that they are wrong if God doesn't exist. Because what are we comparing it to? What is our objective standard? What is our objective thing that we're looking at? If God doesn't exist, if rules from a higher power, a supreme being, an intelligent, a pure being doesn't exist, how can we objectively say something is wrong, something is not? We can't explain. But we know that feeling we have inside us. That if you're torturing a baby, if you're crashing planes into a, uh, crashing planes into a building, that it is wrong. Why? Because God has written in all of our hearts this moral law, this moral compass, that these things just aren't right. That it's just not okay. We can't explain it scientifically. If God doesn't exist, it's an opinion. Why is it though? Like none of you guys could explain to me. No one in this room could explain to me why uh, what they did was wrong, besides saying it's my opinion. Some things we just have to take by faith. Like it is written in us. Like if I was to, what's your name? If I was to steal your shoes right now, Dagum, <laughs> if I was to steal your shoes, what would you do? Uh, Don't be me, you're a firefighter. <laughs> you would try to get him back, right? right. You try to get him back because what I did was wrong. And if I said that's your opinion, you'd be like, you're crazy, bro. <laughs> right? right? But that's the argument atheists use all the time. That's the argument atheists use all the time. God doesn't exist. These things that are right or wrong are just opinions to you. This doesn't make, this is just being petty at that point. Right? I could give you a whole scenario of this, but I don't wanna I don't wanna confuse people. I mean I just had a whole debate on this by the way and I really embarrassed them, so I don't wanna continue, I don't wanna keep I don't wanna keep it going. I don't wanna keep it going. So those three things are just three of many arguments for the existence of God. 
three of many things. So now I'm going to say this and I'm going to wrap up. So the whole purpose of this course, if you came in late, is beyond a reasonable doubt. We will never be able to prove 100% not just because we can't see him, but we can believe it beyond a reasonable doubt. Why? Because we believe everything else behind reasonable doubt. We haven't seen George Bush, we haven't seen Abraham Lincoln, we haven't seen all these events, we haven't seen the Holocaust happen, but we believe it beyond reasonable doubt because there is documents preserved. There was eyewitness testimony. There was personal testimony, all these kind of things, so we can prove beyond reasonable doubt it existed. Now, if God exists beyond a reasonable doubt, which God is it? Which God is it? Is it one God? Is it multiple gods? Is it nature? Is it the universe? Which one is it? How do we know? So, what did we say earlier? Is God confined by time? He's above time, right? Therefore, he is what? It starts with the I? Infinite. infinite. Thank you. He's infinite. So that's what we established, right? God has to be infinite. Whatever the God is, he has to be infinite. Infinite. Are you guys with me? Are you guys with me? Whoever the God is, he has to be infinite. So the problem with believing multiple gods, and these are your Buddhists, these are your people who believe in Hinduism, these are all these kind of people. The problem with believing in multiple gods is if there's multiple gods, by definition, God is not infinite. Because to have multiple, there has to be differences between them. And if there's differences, that means there's something one God lacks that the other has. And if you are lacking something, you are no longer infinite. Did I go past anyone's head? We good? So, when, so, that, so I'm setting the stage now for the next several weeks. We're going to be talking about Judaism, Islam, and Christianity for this purpose. Because they all believe in one God, and that fits the definition of infinity. Infinite. That's why I'm not going to talk about Hinduism, Buddhism, all these things. Because we establish God has to be infinite. We establish that. So for the next several weeks, we're going to analyze Islam. And that's what a lot of people have been asking about this. We're going to analyze Islam. We're going to analyze Judaism. We're going to compare it to Christianity. We're going to see what's true. When you come here, come with an open heart. You ready to listen? You ready to have your own opinion? But I'm gonna ask you guys this. Atheists believe Jesus came to earth. Atheists believe that. Every atheist believes that. Jesus came to earth. He existed. Jews believe in God. Jews believe in God. Muslims believe in God and Mary. And they believe Jesus existed. What makes Christians different? What makes us different? You have the Trinity. Jesus is God. What did we say in the, in the creed? Right? They got so a bunch of Christians back in the day. A lot of people had a lot of confusion on what they believed. So they gathered at a council and they came up with a creed. And it says something like this. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the begotten Son of the Father, who was with him before the creation of the world. That's what we believe. We believe in Trinity. We believe in Trinity. Now, a lot of people have this problem with bro. Like, a mu famous Muslim debater, if you were in class a couple weeks ago, last week actually I said this, a famous Muslim debater said this. He's like, these Christians say God is three, and some days they say he's one. Some days they say he's one, some days he's three. What is it? These Christians can't make their minds up. You guys see what they're saying? It makes no sense. I'm glad it doesn't. How, who are we to understand what the Creator is? We don't even understand the creation fully, but we're asking to understand the Creator fully. We don't know what the universe is like fully, which is not, which is, uh, which is not infinite as we established, but we want to know an infinite God. As creations, we want to know an infinite God, what His identity is. Does that make sense? We don't even know what 80% of the ocean holds, but we claim we know who created it, what He looks like, what He's like, what His nature is like. That's why we call it Mystery of the the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. We don't know how they're three and one, one and three, and be perfectly united as one still. We don't know, but that's what it is. We'll talk about that at a different time. It's deep, but I'm glad we don't know. I'm glad we don't have the answers for that. We have explanations for it. We have explanations for it, like so we can understand it a little bit better, but we can never fully say it, fully understand it. And I'm going to end with this. Does Christ, does Christ care how you identify him? Does Christ care what you think about him? Or is he more concerned of, you know, just be happy, be nice, be kind? Does he care about how you identify him? Does that matter to him? Yes. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region in Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say I am? He's talking to his disciples. He said, what do people think of me? Who do they say that I am? And they said this. Some people say you're John the Baptist, Christ. 
Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. And some say you're Jeremiah. And Christ is like, okay, very good. What do you say that I am? What do you, my followers, my disciples, what do you say I am? They said, you are the son of the living God. You are the Lord. You are God. You are the Savior. You are all powerful. You are all mighty. And he says, blessed are you for identifying this. That is the problem with singing Kumbaya and saying, oh, if you don't believe in Jesus, well, that's fine. Like, we don't have to be rude to people. I'm not saying, like, you know, I was teaching my, uh, my like, little kids, right? I teach, like, my cousins during high school, freshman, sophomore. And I'm teaching about evidence for Christianity against Islam and stuff. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that makes so much sense. Thank you, Abba. The moment they leave, they FaceTime their Muslim friend. And they're like, your religion is false. Like, you know, they're going at it. I'm like, yo, that's not the point. That is not the point of this. I don't want you guys to leave this room and think, like, you can disrespect people of other religions and all these things. No, that's not my point. My point is Christ cares how he's identified. He says, I am the son of the living God. That is who I am. I need to be identified as such. Anything that falls short of that is not a follower of me. It's not a follower of me. In the beginning... God created the heavens and earth. Where's that from? Genesis. 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 That's the very first verse, right? In the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. That is infinite. Like, well, not infinite. We should stop that. I was calling myself up. But that is all, like, almost infinite. We can't even fathom how big it is. It's too complicated for us. God created that. He created all the stars. He created the moon. He made everything perfect just for us. And we were his last creation. He made it all for us. This is who our God is, all powerful, almighty. We put our trust, we put our trust in like many things. We put our trust on like, on planes, for example, right? I'm just terrified of planes. But to a certain degree, we all put our trust in planes and we put our trust in who? The engineer of the planes. But a lot of us struggle to put our trust in the engineer of the universe. When stuff holds on us, when things get hard, when things get bad, we run away from it. We hide from them. We have to put our trust in this being. We put our trust in doctors all the time, surgeons. Why? Because they're knowledgeable about how the body works. Who's more knowledgeable about you than God? Nobody. There's a saying, right? Don't tell God how big your problem is. Tell your problem how big God is. Don't tell God how big your problem is. Uh, say it. Problem, Don't tell God how big your problem is. One time, everybody. Tell your problem how big God is. What's what happened there? Okay, so we got a lot of people in here. Uh, how, what time is that? I need a time check. Okay, we got we got fifteen minutes to discuss. Actually.